We on? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Basketball Heads Live. I'm your host, Glenn Poole Harding. And tonight, we have a very special guest. This basketball head is one of the big men to come out of New York City. We talked about a legit seven-footer. We don't get too many of those, so we're going to celebrate this one. He attended Roosevelt High School before transferring to Adelaide Stevenson High School in the Bronx, where he was an all city performer. After leaving Stevenson, this basketball head signed a letter of intent to attend Villanova University from 1991 to 1993. But then after that, he moved on to Fresno State University from 1993 to 1995. And once he got there, he made himself into a second round draft pick. You know, the league, the NBA, the Denver Nuggets. During the lockout season, though, so he took his talents overseas. And he performed well in Greece, Spain, Italy, Cyprus, France, Portugal, China, Venezuela, and Lebanon, just to name a few. Besides being a pro bowler, this basketball head is an awesome artist. Man, I thought my guy and resident artist Jamel Powell had it going on with all the artwork he do for all the fellas. But this dude takes it to another level. Just check out his Instagram page at AntPell. That's A-N-T-P-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E, so you can check out some of his amazing work. So without further ado... Help me welcome to the show, Adelaide Stephen High School great, the Fresno University standout, Anthony Pill. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? ready? Yes. 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 You have you just have stepped out into, into the into world, world of chaos. chaos. Where everybody, Where everybody goes, goes hard. hard. Come on, come on. Go hard. 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 Or go home. Never back down. You gotta hold your own. Go hard. 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 East Coast. Go hard. West Coast. Go hard. Midwest. Go hard. Dirty, dirty. Help me up, everybody. Get on. Buy your tickets because the game about to start. What's going on, man? I'm chilling. What's good, man? How you doing? I'm doing well in yourself. Doing well in yourself. How's the day taking you in? I have no complaints, man. Life is good. <laughs> good. I, I hear some, like, some water in the background. I hear some. Yeah, that's this huge fish tank, man. <laughs> it's too loud. Like, I, I just go with some water running, you know. I, I, you know. Oh, okay, nah, I'm good over here. As long as it's not interfering with you, man. Nah, nah, we, I'm good. I'm good, fam. I'm good. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's, I, know probably, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to kill a fist. I mean, I could try and, I mean, I was right next to Is that a little bit better? Yeah. A lot better. Okay. A lot better. Well, now okay. I really can't see you, so I want you to be comfortable, though. You know what I'm saying? No, I'm good. For me, it was just about the lighting. So, like, this is the best spot with the most lighting. Like I said, whatever you need, man. I'll nah, move around and make it, get, get make it best for you. So, we, so, the people who haven't seen you in a while, it's a lot of people that miss you, fam, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I haven't been paying attention as much. I've been so focused, man. That's all I do is just stay focused. Man, <laughs> and, and, and a time like this, you should, my brother, for sure. Yeah, I sure. guess. But I don't know. That, and that's the thing, man. I mean, with everything going on, I mean, I, I know what's going on, but I've been so focused for so long. It's just a part of life. You know, it, it for become, me. It for could you. become regimented after this, after this time. Yeah, so like me being focused is a part of life. So when everything else happening around it, that's just like, just like waking up in the morning. <laughs> and, and and you you performing in those huge arenas, knowing that it's a lot going on, and a lot of people in your ears and going on. You have to stay focused and get television sometimes. And, and and literally, that's how it has to be, you know. And and 
and it's hard to explain that to people sometimes because it's not it's not an arrogance it's not a cockiness but it's a type of vision that even the greats will tell you about it's a type of focus when you knew, even if they're not telling you about it when you talk to them you understand it you know it's just a different level of words that they use when they're explaining what they're doing and what they're going through. So you, you begin to understand, man. Listen, I, I, I seen a clip of Kobe getting his finger jam in the game, right? And then going to the sidelines just so his trainer could pull it out and he go <laughs> right back into the game. Now, most of us, we get our finger jam, it's, we just focusing on the pain, you know what I mean? I, I understand, but you you got to remember, some of us ball players, and I, that's why I say I'm not even talking about me. Some of us in a different category. Some of y'all jam y'all finger and stop. <laughs> no, I get some it. I get it. You know what I'm saying? No, that's, that's, that's real. I, I've been in that situation before, and I also been in a situation where I, I went in the game, sprained my ankle, went right back in the game, yeah. but it's just at that moment. But and, and that's the thing, too, because even earlier, I tell people all the time, early in my career, it wasn't like that, you know. So I had to learn these things over time. So, you know, I, I, I always remember the worst, very worst ankle sprain I've had in my entire life career picking up a basketball was at Stevenson. Mm. After after that, my every other ankle sprain after that was never that serious. Like, my ankles swelled up, like, really huge. Like, after a practice or a game, I can't remember specifically. But ever since then, every other ankle twist and turn and sprain has never been that bad. I remember on my right foot, I remember I missed practice for the next two days, but it, it changed my life. <laughs> yeah, know? sometimes an injury can do that, man. So I want to jump right into this, man. What I usually ask all my guests who come on the show is, who introduced you to the game? Who introduced me to the game? Yes. Uh, I would have to start with, I would have to say Kennard Robinson. I would have to say- I know a friend of the show, my friend of the show. Definitely salute to Kennard. My boy, uh, and the thing is, we just called him Freeman. <laughs> but my boy Reggie Freeman, his brother. So it wasn't Red, wow. but his brother. Because his, bro his brother used to do security at Olinville when I was at Olinville. Because literally, I started to go to Olinville right when I moved back up from, from Long Island. So he was like one of the first people that used to see me in school. And he saw it like he knew I had talent. Like he actually saw my art and he saw me doing all of these other sports in Olinville and then kind of like pushed me towards basketball a little bit. Even still, when I left Olinville and went to Roosevelt, I was still really into volleyball and baseball and soccer because my, my pops was into soccer. So when I went to Roosevelt, one of the first things I got into was volleyball. I made the volleyball team before I made the basketball team. Wow. And I guarantee you, all the guys who played against you or know you, a lot of them don't even know that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, there's a lot this, of, this is part of your history, yeah. brother. Well, that's the thing, man. I've done a lot. I mean, I ran track and field. You know, I did all that stuff, man. I did a little bit of everything. Wow. And, and, when I was in a... I was at Fresno State one year, like in the off season, I just needed an extra, what do they call it, electorate or extra some credits. I even took tennis. So I, I played almost all sports. I even played golf before. Wow. <laughs> That's great. And, and besides basketball, which one of them that you kind of, if you didn't play basketball, which one you probably would have been doing if you didn't wind up playing ball? It's hard to say, man, because, I mean, I, I used when being young, I used to always watch my father going down to play soccer down in Central Park in, uh, I can remember the name, Marcus Garvey Park, and some other park there in Harlem. But then at the same time, the things I used to watch on TV, you know, I used to just like. So for me, yeah, I, I wouldn't have minded playing soccer, but me, naturally, I was just good at running and jumping. So I liked volleyball and track and field. Nice, you know, nice. So even, so even when I was in Long Island, I tried certain events, you know, living out there. But 
I don't know. It's, I, I think my older brother kind of stirred me away from basketball in the early years because he just used to beat me. Like he wasn't really, and nothing against him, but he just wasn't really teaching me. He was just like, take this whipping and get out of here. <laughs> Yo, sometimes older brothers do that to us, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. So when you moved from Long Island, you ended up in the Bronx? Yes. Uh, literally, if I can remember specifically, around the Fordham Road, t bout area, 188th, around there. And that was, that was it. That was the beginner. And what age did you fall in love with the game? That's the that's like I said. It's like I've always loved the game. Cause one, I've always loved all sports. I was just a natural athlete. You know, honestly, I just I was never partial to losing. So when my brother was beating me, it just steered me away from basketball. You know, so I still did it on my own in other places and a few friends here and there. But it wasn't until we came back from Long Island and after Olinville and then right to Roosevelt. Like I said. Because Olinville, I met Freeman, was doing a few things there. You know, you know the era we grew up in, so, you know, basketball was big, you know. Yeah, so definitely. I'm catching on, and I ain't going to lie, I sucked. <laughs> so things were going on, you know, but I, I was learning the hard way. And then with everything else going on in life, I ended up moving. They ended up going to Roosevelt, meeting some more people. Some things changed and went from there. Now, did you start playing? Like with the referees and everything, official basketball when you got to Roosevelt or you played as a pre-team? I would say it started officially at Roosevelt because after Roosevelt, then came Gauchos and Riverside. Oh, okay, you know, cause okay. They, yeah, because yeah, from there, I went down to Riverside. So Roosevelt came first and then Riverside Church. You know, no so... Doubt. Listen, I want to shout out my guy, Jeff Ward. He's on the board. The trustees at Riverside right now. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Riverside. And, and my know, guy, I, Tony Hargreaves, who's the director. So, salute to those guys. Shout out to both of them, too, man. Much love. Serious. So, and can what you, was that can you see me up, like? Can you see me okay? Are you all right? No, nah, I see you. I see you very well. Okay. I see you very well. Yeah? What was that first game like, and The first game you played in with referees and... Had a uniform or shirt on. What was what was that like? What would you do that? It was hard for me because, like I said, I've never played a, a game like that. I've never played in front of a crowd, really. Like I mean, like I said, you play in front of people, but you didn't play in front of a, a crowd that's literally sitting there only to watch you. Right. That was different. <laughs> that was kind of new for me, you know. But um. It was an adjustment period. Like I said, you know, I was shy when I was young. I was going through a lot. You know, it was, you know, I was coming into myself because my family was from the island. So I had an island background, you know. So us islanders, we're a little bit different. <laughs> so the, for me, with basketball and, and everything else, like I said, it was all an adjustment, man. It, it was just about learning the hard way. But I just, just think I had some good people around me. That's it. That's, that's that's all it is. I'm just lucky and blessed to have good people around me, man. That's all it is. Well, whether you know it or not, man, 90% of the guys who come on here, their first game is nerve-wracking. <laughs> right? When I ask that question, it's like there was so much going on. You know, referees, you got to remember plays. You got to remember where to cut, where to go to. And for a lot of us, when we get in there, it's kind of nerve-wracking. It's only a small few of us who just snatch you at it, right? And and it's easy going. But for that first game, forget about it. Another story I like to tell people when I when I when I tell them that I used to suck was that uh there was a time one of the first games I played with Johnny Mathis, you know, I tell him, look, it took me 30 minutes just to tie my sneakers. <laughs> 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 wow. I didn't want to get on, I didn't want to get on the layup line. I didn't want to do nothing, man. So, I mean, and that's the thing for me. It wasn't even about not knowing the plays. Like I said, I was a good athlete. My memory was awesome. I was just nervous. <laughs> you know, once I got through that, because it was about making the mistakes for me, it was about doing the right thing. You know what I mean? So I, I work hard and practice, and I'm learning the plays, and I'm doing all of this. I don't want to go in a game and mess up. 
you know, it was, you know, you, when you're young, it's different, man. Definitely, definitely. And salute to both Johnny Mathis and Johnny Mathis Jr. Both was for on sure. the show. Most definitely. Salute. Shout out to both of them. Yep, yep, for sure. Hey, man, when did that growth spurt start to take form? Because, you know, I went to Lincoln at 5'8", right? Uh -huh. And my coach, my head coach, and my assistant coach had a beef because my head coach selected me as a freshman. This is like 1983, which was unheard of. We didn't even have a JV. And my assistant coach wasn't too pleased. He was like, you picked this five base skinny kid. What are you going to do? <laughs> that next summer, I was 6'4". <laughs> and by the time I came back to school, I was 6'5". And my coach looked at my assistant coach like, this is why I picked him. Right? Yeah. Because we, you never know what's going to happen. When was that growth See, for me, and when did when everything started to change? Those who really know me, and, you know, shout out to my boy, Cal. <laughs> but uh, I've always been a little bit taller than everybody else. So I don't care from third grade school pitchers, sixth grade, you know, it's all the same. But like you said, that spurt, I would say would have had to come, I'm thinking Roosevelt, because I remember, see, I, I, I mentioned Roosevelt a lot because those were the years I was training myself to dunk. You know, I was getting my own timing down. And, and you know, they was like, try this and try this. So, you know, I'm, I'm learning on the fly. You know, so I, I can't really say, man. Like I said, it's just, it's just a lot in the process for me. So you don't know when, when the growth spurt took over, when you became, you know, was you, you was you were seven feet in the junior high school, like Will Chamberlain, those guys? It was just like, it's like, I don't know. 6'9", 6'10", 6'11", all, all that's a blur. <laughs> that whole that whole time frame went kind of fast. That's why I say it. Cause I, that's why I say Roosevelt was in that time period. So somewhere between Roosevelt, Stevenson, and that first year at, uh, at Villanova, I was still growing. <laughs> wow. You know, yeah, so... That's why I say it's difficult to explain because I definitely was taller at Villanova than I was at Fresno State. That's a fact. I mean, not at Fresno State, than at uh, Stevenson. Right, right, right. You know, so. Wow. So, so was uh, Kennard Robinson, he was the guy in the neighborhood that everybody aspired to be like? Who was the best, I wouldn't was even the best guy in the neighborhood when you was coming up, up in the BX? See and that, all right. See, then that's the other thing too. I wasn't, I wasn't the biggest knower or followers of other guys. See, I would just go to parks. See, I would, I, I was the type of guy that even though I wasn't, I would remember, I, I remember, I was still young. I was just tall, you know. So I'm just around older guys. I'm around them because I'm taller, <laughs> but I'm still the youngest one in the group. So they're just asking me to come along. We're going to parks here and there, going to different places. So. I mean, yeah, of course, I mean, we have our, our known greats that everyone knows that you grow up with and you hear them throughout your life. But to say back then at, you know, Roosevelt and Stevenson, there were always names. And just off the top of my head, just, you got to think of high schools, you know, Boys and Girls High School was big, All Hallows High School, Christ the King High School, and, and these are all my peers. And it just literally popping into my head, uh, my man Mash, uh, the Khalid Reeves, you know, just random names that just pop in because you, it's not about for me. It wasn't about a competition. These are just guys I knew and grew up with. I played ball with. They knew I was a little young. I was trying hard. They wasn't. I mean, and they was respectful and helping me. That, that's how I looked at it. Well, you what know, about one? It was never, what about one guy named uh, Kenny Anderson? <sighs> He's on you know, the right now. Check you out. Say what's up to Kenny Anderson. <laughs> okay, what's up, man? <laughs> K.A. But that, that's the thing. Like I said, I, I, was in a, I was in one of the, for me, the best position. I, was all, I felt like I was always in a learning position. I never felt like I was ever competing. I felt like, like I always had someone to talk to that was showing me or teaching me. My attitude was a little rough, so it was – 
things would go a little wild. I always, like I said, I was the youngest. So there was always that one person that was there. And I'm not going to lie, Kenny was there. Dave Kane was there. Mike Hugo was there. There was a bunch of people throughout my career was there. A friend that I was overseas with, Daryl Middleton. But these are all guys in different periods of my life that have the age, the experience. I don't care if I was 18, 28, or 38. There was somebody there for me, you know? Yo, hold on. We talking about Dow Milton from Queens. Yeah. Let me explain something to you. Wait, wait, wait. Do you know where he is right now? You know, do you know where he is right now? Where's he at right now? He's in Turkey. He got a restaurant. I'm see. We're gonna we're gonna talk. I got plans. Yo, brother, <laughs> he, he doing let me a lot. Tell you. He just he just won another championship a couple of years ago. He's still I, playing. Listen, D needs to <laughs> come on the show so we can celebrate him. I'm so proud of him. I played on the Empire State team with him. Right. That is my brother, man. That that is my brother right there. Him and he I, we so, killed. He is so good, like. We destroyed Spain. And now we, we put, like the Michael Jordan of Spain. <laughs> we put a lot of highlights up in Spain. Put it this way. I got to mention, too, Dan Cross. Like I said, I have people that I've played with around the world that we have memories. Me and Dan Cross made highlights for the entire country in Greece for the entire year. Every wow. weekend. Every weekend, me and Dan Cross. Are you kidding me? I, I love that man to death. <laughs> See? Right? And God's thought and pill disappeared off the face of the earth and he's overseas getting busy putting up numbers, well, making highlight reels. Well, but that's the thing, too. Once that was done, I'm at home with family. That That's, I, I said, I mean, I, I may have had my moments and I'd go out and have a good time, but the reason people didn't see me because after you saw me doing what I did, I went home. <laughs> I went, yeah. Right. It was simple for me. You you go out there, you work hard, you play hard, you take your ass home and go to sleep. <laughs> wow. So what what park? Let's get some park, some shout out, man. You know the name of the oh, park man. that you went to to develop the game and saw you know everybody out there playing. And and so you know I, I've been around so much, so my memory was off. So I'm just gonna say things, and all of you may remember. I have to start behind the building, 875 Boynton. I have to start with everything in that neighborhood around Stevenson. Uh, we used to call it behind the S because TSS used to be up there, and they changed to Alexander's, Kitty City. It's been <laughs> everything up there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm trying to think. Uh, been through Monroe. Like I said, any anything in that Soundview, Lafayette area, I played in. Mm. Rosedale, all of it. Uh, Kips Bay, all of it. You want to go, let's move a little bit downtown. Like I said, it's hard, man, because I can't even leave the neighborhood because then as I'm coming, let's just say I'm uh, trying to remember the street, Brooklyn Boulevard, and I'm coming down that direction. I'm going to pass the park where me and Malloy used to play. You know, so like I said, just we're even about, leaving my... talking about New York City legend Malloy Naismith. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, of course, the future. That's right, that's right. <laughs> See, that's why I say... For me, it's, 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 it's different when I tell it because when I say it's nothing, I don't mean it like it's nothing. I, I understand the, the, the effort, the time, the blood, the sweat and tears that these great men have put in. But for me, that's normal. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when I talk about it, these, these, these men that I see on this level, this is just everyday stuff for us. You know what I mean? So me leaving my house and seeing – these people that we look at now was normal every day. This was everyday work. You left your house and it was a challenge every day. You you go into this park and you no, know, we're having fun, but it's a battle. Somebody's going to get hurt. We're having having fun. We're going to draw a crowd. It's, that's just how it went. You know, I, I'm trying to think of everything right now. So one a, a crew we had, me, Dewan Maxwell, Kubi from Kubi TV. The twins, Owen was with us. Gordon Winchester was with us. It was too many of us. Like, like I said, we. It was Shay was with us. So we had different types of crews that we would go in different places. And not to mention, if I was with my crew in Harlem, so if I hooked up with Dave and Mike, and then oh man, uh, Auto. I used to see Auto all the time. So it's a whole bunch of people, man. That's just a part of the the life in the community that you meet throughout the years that you just realize that, yes, 
this person spoke to me, this person helped me. And you just gotta be thankful for that, man. Like I said, I've just been in the right places at the right times with the right people. That's it. That's real, man. So what what made you go to Roosevelt, man? Let's talk about that. What made you go to Roosevelt and why? Family. Just moving across the city, you know, because with, with us being out in Long Island for a couple of years, because, of course, we're from the city, and I was born in Harlem, going out to Long Island for a few years, but coming back to the city, well, that was just kind of it. You know, it wasn't like, we talking about you know, Roosevelt it was just like family. Jay went, correct? Roosevelt High School in the Bronx. Oh, we're talking about the Bronx. Okay, I think you talking about Long yeah. Island. Okay, my bad. All right, all right, all right. No, no, no. When I was living out in Long Island, that's kind of where just all sports started. Got you, but then got when you, I got, got then you. when I got to New, when I came back to New York, is when I still was into a few other sports, and then I whittled it down to basketball within like three years of me being back in New York. Because like I said, when I was in Oldenville, I was still. You know, doing a little bit of volleyball, still doing a little bit of baseball and some basketball. Then when I literally transferred from Olinville to Roosevelt, I was only doing volleyball and basketball. And then before the year was over, I was only doing basketball. Mm. So, so what adjustments did you have to go through moving from Rose, Roosevelt to Stevenson? Were there any adjustments you had to go through? Everything. <laughs> you know, so I went from living with my pops to my grandmother. The school itself was different. The neighborhood was different. Remember, Fordham Road was wild back in the days. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so just imagine I'm coming down University Avenue, and then I'm going down Fordham, and then I'm right in the heat of everything, you know. And Roosevelt back then, that you know, there was no metal detectors and gates. You just walk in with it, you know. <laughs> tell them. Tell them, man. Tell them. There were no metal detectors doing that. Like I said, you, you could be in the classroom and, you know, you looking around and you might have a little beef with somebody. You might just pull out his bag and be like, I'm waiting for you at the school. <laughs> that, was, that was everyday life. Right, right. <laughs> oh, boy. But that's what, I, that's, what kept, that's what kept life good for me because, like I said, I had basketball as an escape. And I had, that's why I keep saying I have good people that were there for me. You know, so... I, I guess I was just one of the lucky ones, man. Wow, man. What's up, Kenny Grandison? I'm doing Fox. What's going on? What's happening, people? Yeah, I haven't even looked down at the, the uh, chat. Yeah, every now and then, I got to shout these guys out. They come to the room and show love. You know what I'm My saying? My boy, Shane Visions Photography. I see you. That's right. So, I, I want to make an announcement to everyone. Um, I need everybody to go to my YouTube page and subscribe. Right, it's the same name, Basketball Heads, um, and check out uh, the Hall of NBA Hall of Famer Charlie Scott interview. Awesome interview! I got a chance to show it to some of my students today for Black History Month. Great interview, man! And uh, tomorrow we have Bertram's own, you know, Miss Corey Coleman. She's on a check-in, so make sure you check out that show tomorrow on YouTube. And everybody go subscribe right now if you haven't already done so. Appreciate you guys. So, um, and, and that's the, the, the Charlie Scott interview right there, just in case okay. you can see it playing in the background. Right. Yeah, you want to check that he, out. Yeah, man, he, he made so much history. A lot of things I didn't even know um, that he went through uh, just coming up and being a, a, a basketball player in New York City. Did you know... He went to Stevenson High School because he had great grades. And, I mean, not Stevenson, Stuyvesant, excuse me. Mm -hmm. He went to Stuyvesant. There was one in 27. With him being one of the best players in the city, they still didn't let him play. Wow. Yeah. The system, he, the he system was funny happen. back then. Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So, let's get back to you, brother. Let, let's talk What's about that? your development and then at Stevenson and some of the battles you had to go through, some of the guys you battled against in high school. Wow. The most I can say, because those the Stevenson years, that was that was big because from Roosevelt to Stevenson, that whole 
ninth, 10th grade transition, it was almost like I went from <laughs> a raw piece of meat to a fully cooked dinner. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, but it wasn't, it wasn't a dinner that was made easily. You know what I mean? So it was like, it was trial and error because everybody, for me, at Stevenson was at another level, especially at that age. Like I said, remember, I was still young. I, have, I wasn't playing that long. These guys are already winning championships and, and trophies and, and outfits and team sneakers and everything else. We was barely getting that over there at Roosevelt. You know, that's, that's what I mean. You know, nothing, nothing disparaging against either school. Like I said, they both had their power and played their part. But the amount of funding, the, 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 the record and everything else was just different. The neighborhood was different. The people were different. And you noticed that when you went to Stevenson. You know, so it was literally night and day. Not only that, the coaching was nice and day. Night and day, excuse me. Mr. Fine to Mr. Post. <laughs> Mr. Fine, I don't know. He was he was the man that also I have to add, I, I can't remember his first name and I apologize for that, but that was my basketball coach over at Roosevelt. Yes. He was he was the man that also found me in the gym with the volleyball team. <laughs> so I have to add I have to add him in the story too. But he was with him it was different because he wasn't really trying I have to mention him because he wasn't really pushing me towards basketball. He just really was talking to me about life and what I wanted and then basketball came with that. Mm. So with Mr. Fine man, he was he was just a good person to me, man. I and I have I have to mention that because even though I have to credit Freeman and credit all these other people that spoke to me about basketball, and I said yes, Mr. Fine did it kind of, even though he wanted me on the basketball team, I got on the basketball team without him pushing the basketball team. Right, right. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So, so that, that was good, too. So I have to mention that. I don't even remember where we left off because I had to mention that, man. <laughs> no, 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 that's good, that's good. No, we, we was talking about... Uh... Some of the guys that you battled back then against. Yeah, so, I mean, everywhere. And for me, I can't even say, and especially now as I'm older, I never even viewed anything as a battle back then because, remember, me being young, I didn't have the viewpoint as everybody else. For me, let's just say as an, as an, as an island kid, I'm just thinking, at, remember, for a long time that this is just something to do. You know, I'm, this is part of high school. This is something I can train myself, and there's a potential for a future that I still don't understand yet. You know, I'm just here now making the best of it now. I know from what I hear that this guy is a great athlete. <laughs> you know, he's a hard worker. He's jumping. He got this 30, 40-something-inch vertical. You know, he could be going to this school. This guy's in this paper. So for me, when you say battles, I just think, I, I still can't view it like that type of battle because, for me, we're all friends. Right. So it's just a matter of me saying to myself, my friends are here in these other places. Because, like I said, that's why I say I'm different because going to Gauchos and Riverside, I knew both sides of the fence. I played in every tournament around the entire city. So there was no real competition for me that I, and I didn't realize until later other than myself. I mean, yeah, people bat people battled against me, but that's because my battle was on the court, not with the people. You see what I'm saying? So even if I'm saying, so we're going to All Hallows today and we're playing MASH and MASH is putting up numbers. You know, we're going to play Salesian and all these guys over here putting up numbers. We're going to, it doesn't matter where we're going. The thing is, I know who I'm playing against and I just have to do my best. <laughs> no, regardless of who I'm playing. So, on top of that, what am I learning? How do I take what I've learned to do my best to stop them from doing what they do and excel at what I'm doing? So not only do I have to stop MASH from getting 30, I have to try and get a double-double myself. I still have to try and get at least 10 rebounds and 10 points. That's, that's a mind game. Imagine doing that for years with everybody you're playing against. That's an NBA great, a street ball legend, that's going to play in all around the world. This is this is my era who I grew up with. It's like <laughs> I'm playing against men 
<laughs> as as young men. I mean, not to be funny, the people like just mentioned in the future again, Malloy. People don't understand, man. I mean, this is just this is just me. This is a person that's been doing it for a very long time. So this this is a mentality I'm talking about. So when I say these people are helping me, and just imagine me coming into a place, a park, and you say it's a battle, or even just going to a place, I'm going out to another park, even though we're not in school, but I'm playing against MASH today in this tournament. For me, it's the same mindset. My friends with experience, they're not trying to make it like a battle competition, but yeah, and we're going to compete. You know, if you, the way I took it, if you was a little bit, if they were on the opposite team, if you was a little bit better, it would have been a better battle. But now you're not that good, so I bust your ass. Excuse my mouth. <laughs> no, no, because but, but, that's going to be the next question. Who, who ass did you bust that was one of those players that let you know you could play with the big boys, even though you was a big boy yourself? But that's the thing. I never view myself like that. I hear the stories from other people, but I I never view myself like that. I view myself as just always having to work and compete to get. Now I don't want to say on on a, on a level where my friends were, because I didn't. I wasn't looking for notoriety like that. I wasn't looking for a type of fame. I wanted respect. You could see that when I played. You could see that in my anger. You could see that in my emotion. That's what I cared about. If we went out there and we battled and you showed me respect, my game was one level. And then people will tell you. People, people from my friends at Villanova, Lance Miller, Dave Miller would tell you. They would tell me before games, you know, Ed, they talk about your mother. So <laughs> they get me angry, so I go out there and play harder. <laughs> true, true. But, that, that's kind of, but that's what it was out there with, with my friends in New York. So it's like I was motivated by different things. You know, so... I wasn't motivated by saying, oh, I got to compete against somebody. I'm motivated by, in, a, in almost all of those cases, like I'm going to be in this place, this area, if either on my team or against somebody where I'm, I'm growing, I'm getting better. So even if I'm not playing, I'm going to be a little upset because I want to play and my skill level may not be there. But I understand I am on an entire roster of mm. people that have been in City championships, state championships, Gauchos, Riverside, uh, Las Vegas trips, Russia games, and all of these other things that we grew up hearing about. I'm not complaining about that. You know, I'm just trying to get to the point where I'm starting and playing all game. You know, and like I said, for me, it wasn't about me competing against them. It's me about getting to the point because I love the game too. Mm. I don't want to sit on the bench either. You know, I don't want to take from you, but – not to be funny, I feel you're looking at me because I'm not in the game. So let me get in the game so you look at me differently. And that right. was my goal. Right. <laughs> so I had to get better to get in the game and get good enough to stay in the game longer. Sounds good. Uh, my guy Garfield Smith in the building on the check-in. He said... I have to mention, have to mention Garfield. For sure. I have to mention Garf. Garfield was a part of that crew that I was talking about when we was going around traveling. You know, so when we meeting up in the city and we going from park to park, place to place, he he was another one, man. He was, and I have to mention golf because I, I have to mention a lot of big bodies too. And I say that because even though I was tall, I was slim. <laughs> you know, so golf was one of those bodies that, you know, as a tall big man, he was also another guy that helped me in my game. So that's why I say it was never a battle for me. So even if I met you in the park, if I met you in your school or wherever else, I never looked at it like I'm going to battle. You know, for me, I'm just going to play a game and somehow, some way, yeah, my emotion made me passionate, but I'm not thinking battle. I'm not thinking competition, you know what I mean? You know, I'm thinking get yours. I'm thinking respect. You know, I'm thinking differently. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you see him today? He's still in shape. Salute to Garp, right? Yeah. Miles, yeah, me, me and Garp, you Miles could, on that bike. <laughs> we <laughs> used to keep track of our ride. I was just about to say that. I haven't been riding since I've been back here in Boston, man. It's been cold. I've been slacking on my working out, but it's, it's coming back. I was literally doing the dumbbell waste today, so nice, I'm back nice. on it. Actually, I, actually, I do it on my off days. I'm trying to get more than three days a week. I'm going light, and I'm definitely not riding as much as I used to. I'm getting back into it. No doubt, no doubt. So, wh when did the letters and the recruitment starting to come in for you? Like, 
with, with those schools and, and those letters that we received as high school players started coming for you? A few started to come in my junior year in Stevenson. You know, I didn't, because that was still the transition. My junior year, because I played partial 11th grade at Roosevelt and partial 11th grade at Stevenson. So in that, there were some letters, but it changed at Stevenson because Stevenson, like I said, was a, was a different animal. So with different elements and energies there, I was seen more. So with being seen more, more promotion, more games, the, the team itself, the coach, and, and the, just the other players that were there before, got to mention uh, Bill Sing Singleton, got to mention Ed Pickney. You know, I already mentioned Mike and David. We had a whole bunch of other people. I don't want to leave anybody out. I don't want to leave out any of my friends. Chris Tate, right Fred Tate. Fred Tate. This, this, is, this is a bunch of people, man. Like I said, I could go on for days with names, but like I said, I, if I keep saying names, then I don't want to leave somebody else out. <laughs> listen, 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 brother. When we, when we get to the top five, it's going to get critical, so you're going to have to leave some names out. Trust me. I, I, well, I don't know. Yeah. We're going to have to talk about that top five when we yeah. get there. <laughs> right. So, um, let, let's talk about that junior year you received the letter. What was the letter that you was kind of surprised about when you saw, like, really? They, they're interested? So, again, I remember now, I, and I have to say this, I have to keep saying as, a, as an island kid, even though I was born in Harlem, my family was Island Antigua, meaning I was raised by my father's side of the family. So I'm not thinking, I, I know, I know this clearly, I had a different mindset. Cause I'm not thinking about sports that every, the way everyone else was thinking about it. So even as I'm getting the letters, it's still not really registering, like how it was registering with a lot of my friends and teammates and peers. For me, I remember one of the first letters that I was getting consistently was DePaul. <laughs> DePaul mm. was always sending me letters, you know, and I remember, but it wasn't registered. So it would come in the mail. I would get them to school. My mom knew, but she didn't really know, you know, <laughs> it was because, you know, life was different back then. So she's more concerned with work, making sure I'm staying in school, doing the right thing and everything else. And I got other siblings. So, she knows where it's going, but she doesn't know that much about DePaul. You know, she's learning more about, you know, me getting a scholarship and everything else, but she's not totally sure, sure yet. You know, so for me, it was like, get the letters and figure it out later. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's like that. Yeah. Yeah. So now, how did you guys finish up your senior year at Stevenson? On a loss, <laughs> it was a, I, I can't. I think it was a city championship, state championship, one of those championship games, and we lost that one. But my thing is, I say that, but I still say it ended on a high note, you know, because all the players were close. We had a good year. We had fun traveling. We stayed close for for years after that. So even though the season ended on a loss, my career at Stevenson at that time. I cried. I'm not. Everybody knows I cried that day. I didn't cry because we lost. I cried because it was over. Who did, yo? Let me tell you. And you're not the only one, fam. <laughs> All of us cried our senior year when the season was over. Even though we was going to greater pasture, we, yeah. we was leaving a place that we called home for four years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, that, and, and that's kind of what two. I mean. And that's that's what it became for me. That's why I said. So when I left Roosevelt, remember Roosevelt was me moving into the city. You know, coming back into New York and everything else, transition, family, moving around. But like I said, when I went to Stevenson, I had moved in with, you know, I'm stable with my grandmother, my father, we're good. I'm like literally up down the block from Stevenson. So it's just a, a bus ride or, or a walk. So like you said, that was family. I knew the neighborhood. Like, I was known there. So when the city, when the season was done, I felt like I was leaving all of it. Yeah. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So yeah. it affected me. So it was different. Yeah, so Gargo said it. our Allen parents had no clue what athletic scholarships were. You know, and I, and that's the thing. That's Like I said, because there was one point, you know, and I, I, I only gave you the beginning of the story. So there was at one point, I remember getting a few letters of my mother coming in and she's saying a few words, but 
a couple months down the road, no lie, I had a duffel bag full of college letters. You know, and she understood by then. <laughs> you know, but it took her a while because there were days the only mail that was coming in the house was for me. Yeah. There were there were there were days where she didn't get anything in the mail, not even a bill. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Oh, yeah. We're usually giving our parents the letters, and then all the letters start coming in for us, and it just changed the whole dynamics of things. You know, and then the other thing I have to add to that, you know, part of the whole island growing up. Remember now, like I said, basketball was was fun for me. It was an escape. It was my second family. But being from now, that's New York, and I have to add that too. That is straight New York. Yeah. Coming from the islands, we didn't know that. So and then I, when I'm coming from Queens and Brooklyn, I'm coming from these Gauchos and Riverside games. I got to say, because it was funny back then and it's funny now. I was locked out the house. <laughs> so people don't know. There were certain games I couldn't go to. So if I got back late, I'm banging on the door to get back in the house, man. <laughs> like I said, everybody's in the house. You might right. wake up. But because we got an island family, and this is what we believe, because we from Antigua, we don't want you coming back in the house at midnight. <laughs> I don't care what train you on. I, man, I can't tell. I used to have a – what's my – Dave McCullough, my coach from, from Gauchos, used to have to call my house all the time. Jay from uh, from Gauchos used to have to speak to my grandmother all the time. Jay spoke to my mother, my grandmother consistently so that she knew that I was out playing the game, that Anthony was going to be coming home late. <laughs> That's real. Garfield said facts. You know, he come from a Caribbean background sure. as well. For sure. For sure. That's wild. That's crazy. So, who who was the coach at Villanova when you decided to, 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 uh, to attend Villanova? Uh, it started with Roly Massimino, ended with Steve Lapis. Nice. And Steve Lapis is a New York guy. And, and was that transition a little difficult going in, in uh, to, Ross, to Massimino's program and then have to transition to Steve Lapis? I'm going to put these three coaches in one paragraph. Roy Massimino, Steve Lapis, Lapis, and Gary Colson. I'm going to start at the end of that, that, that little sentence. Gary Colson is a better coach. Mm. And the only reason I say that it has nothing to do with coaching ability. It's about how you relate to the players. I learned I learned a lot more from him than from and like I said I'm not talking about my personal experience with dealing with these men. I'm just talking about what I've learned from coaches. I'm saying that because one conversation with Gary Colson sent me to the NBA. And we talking about your Fresno State coach. Yes. You know, everything I went through was a transition and it was a battle and it was a learning experience. And even at Fresno State, I was still learning. But it was about a level of understanding for me to get something done that these coaches were trying to get out of all players. I'm just going to say Gary Colson found that thing and he changed my life and my career. <laughs> I'm going to say that. I can talk about these guys that everyone else knows. I don't want to talk about them. I want to talk about Gary Colson. No, that's that's all that's all real, man. And sometimes we have to make uh, a move for ourselves to put ourselves in a better situation to find that. But I, and I think and that's the thing because when I when I told the story and and this is a truth and it's not against anybody. This is politics. This is sports. Lapis came in. He was making changes. He wanted what he wanted from his crew that he recruited. I wasn't a part of that. He made it clear to me personally directly from the statements that were made was the reason why I went to the West Coast. <laughs> you know, What's I wouldn't that, say I, that. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, I'm, I'm trying to bite my tongue and be nice, but the game no, is brutal. Listen, 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 this, this, your story's only going to be told through your, through your, through your voice, right? Okay. So, time, this, we have so, to well, these things out. I say this all the time. Let me make it easier for you. I didn't go to the big time school. I went to Fairleigh Dickinson. Even though I had an opportunity to go, I, I thought I could go there and rewrite the record books. The first game I started, I took a senior's position. Now, 
That game I started, I had 25 points. I think I missed one shot. And the assistant coach who recruited the guy whose spot I took came into the locker room and told me I would never do that again. It, it totally crushed my confidence that I wanted to transfer. But my mom yeah. was old school. She was like, no, you're going to stick it out. We don't quit. Move on. Yeah. You stay here. Right? But at that time, it did something to my confidence, which I, did, I couldn't understand because I thought I was doing a good thing. And we talked about getting caught up in the politics of basketball. And kids yeah. need to hear this because some kid is going to go through this and not know how to handle it. Okay, so, and that's the thing, because I try to be diplomatic, because not to be funny, there's a lot of POSs out there, to be blunt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then when it comes to that money, when you're in, involved with big programs, scholarships, sponsorships, coaches will say anything to kids. <laughs> You know, and just to keep it simple, again, because it wasn't about me, because it's a blessing in disguise, I was told literally kind of to not transfer to another Big East school. I was kind of threatened in a type of way when it came to, I don't know, I guess I don't want to say it like that, but it was a threat. It was what it was, <laughs> you know, because he called me into the office out of study hall. You know, he made a statement to me about not doing this and not doing that, and if you do this, I'll mess up your reputation from Maine to Florida. Steve Lapis said this to me in his office. I, he pulled me out of study hall. We had a meeting, and then I went back to study hall. And then I have to finish out the rest of the, the whatever days of build over like that. <laughs> but like I said, it turns into a blessing because I ended up meeting Gary Colson. That's why I say, you know, and with Massimino, hardworking man, has his achievements, and people love him. He's not the best people per person either. <laughs> you know, no disrespect to him. We every everyone has their ups and downs in life. You know what I mean? Nobody has a perfect relationship with anybody. That's you right. know, I didn't have the and I didn't have the best relationship with Gary Colson, but he understood people. He understood players. You know, and what he wasn't the type of guy that understood us New Yorkers like we're used to, but he understood Anthony the person that was different than any other coach that I've dealt with. And like I said, I don't know, I guess I can't remember everything, but he spoke to me about family and my responsibility in a way that I said, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to, like I said, it was it was a no brainer for me after I get chills thinking about it, man. Mm. I said, all these coaches and all they yelling and all they examples, no, no, it wasn't shit. <laughs> Just to be blunt, all this talk about all these other players and watch, no. When you can relate to a person's thinking and his heart to what they want and you can drive them, like I said, that's when you sit back and you let the person drive. And that's what happened. <laughs> like, literally, he says something, like I said, cause it was, like I said, life wasn't even bad then, but he put it in a way where I could take care of my whole family. That's what I did. I, like I said, people had NBA dreams. I had dreams of taking care of my family. I had dreams of doing but my entire family, and I did that. That's real, man. Uh, who's this? Call BX uh, Rouser Trouser? Yes, yes, it's nice yes. Nice dude showing you love. Uh, Garfield Smith said, uh, you can speak your truth, brother. Listen, I had Malcolm Grant on here the other day. University of Miami great, Paul Robinson great, and he talked about the politics. I had so many ball players who get caught up in the politics, and sometimes kids don't understand. We get a lot of love, and we get nurtured by our high school coaches, and then we get into the business of college basketball, and things can change. You know what? The politics go all the way, man. I mean, when I'm, I, if you want, remember now, and this is why I, and I don't do a lot of shows because I know a lot. I played in almost every league, so I've seen a lot of politics. I can tell you about shady agents and what they do. If you have this agent, he has two players, and you're both trying to get them on this one, any team. I don't care if it's an NBA team. I don't care if it's an overseas team. I don't care if it's a CBA team. I don't care if it's an NBA, NBDL team. There's some type of back deal going on with these players and some type of money. And it's, it's, it's known. Like I said, I say this because at one point I was going to become an agent. So then you're talking to agents. And so as you're informing me 
however many years after my career, I'm still understanding now how that applied to the BS that went on while I was playing. Mm. So like I said, you get to see these deals. I had an Asian double dip and I had all type of issues, man. Yep. Yes. Yep. Tell me, tell me about the double dipping. Tell me about the double dipping. And so and, um, players and young people who don't understand what's going on, you can kind of break it down for them. Let's just say that's an agent getting paid twice when he shouldn't be getting paid twice. That's the simplest way to put it. You know, and when I mean getting paid twice, I mean I am or you are paying him twice. Through contracts and through certain understandings and writings, his payment from me is supposed to be once. So I'm paying him for his services and the team is paying him for whatever else. I'm not supposed to be paying him for another thing. So even if this agent in this time in my career, I may be playing overseas, but every year I got NBA tryouts. Every year I'm trying out for four and five teams. So I have an agent agency where I'm working with overseas teams and NBA teams. There's, there's, there's work in there where money's involved and players are involved and it gets real ugly. <laughs> That's the most I want to say about it, man. Like I said, it was, a, it was a lot. And I've seen other people go through worse. Like I said, I've seen guys struggle, man, just because of agents alone. You know, and... And this has nothing to do with their game or performance nothing, on the court. Nothing. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. You know, just because this one agent thought that this other one player would be a better investment. Simply. Simply put, that was it. Or just because this one agent heard third hand that something may have happened and didn't confirm it or didn't. I don't know. That's why I say it could be so petty. You know, it can be, they can take it serious. It can affect your career. It can affect your life and it can affect your children. But they're not looking at it like that. They're looking at money. You know, people don't want to really say that, think that, or believe that, but it is always about the money. They can sit there with you, and we can have dinner, and we can have clams and lobsters and all type of bread. We can have women on the table. We can have lions in the background. And in the end, I'm going to tell you, we're going to have it all popping. But in the end, it's about money. And if I'm not getting my money, you out of here. <laughs> wow. Yo, salute to my guy, Rob Phelps, on the check-in. Definitely Rob Phelps. Rob was another one that was in the traveling crew at different times. Not only that, Rob, that, I, that's what, I can't remember everybody. There are too many people that have been there. When you see these names and you want to drop them, let me know. Because like I said, there are too many. Rob is another one. I, 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 don't, I, guess I, don't have, I don't have any competition. I don't have any for me. I, I don't know how guys see me. I went out there and I played hard. I wanted my respect. And then we laughed and joked and went home. But I had nothing personal with anybody. Yo, you know, the way I look at it. Popping, popping in and out of the room, getting a lot of love, fam. Trust me. And that's how I felt, man. That's, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's real, man. And, and look, I, I explain this to kids all the time, right? Let me just use this as an example. Terrence Wrencher, always use him as an example. Great guy. Mm -hmm. Super, Always. Uh, awesome Great college person. coach right now. Yes. Karen Richard was Mr. Basketball in New York City. Then went to Texas and became Texas' leading scorer. Uh -huh. Got drafted first round and had to start all over again. Yeah. Right? And get caught up in, in, in the process. And kids don't realize that. A lot of kids just think, well, if I'm good enough, I play college basketball, I'm going to high school, I'm going to the league, and it's a wrap. Like, nobody can stop me, not knowing there's a whole different level. You deal with you know college what? politics, there's a whole different level of politics that goes on in the NBA and overseas. I, I, I think that's the one thing I want to add now for anybody that's listening now and wants to see this in the future. I think people need to young men and women that are into any sport, and right now we're talking about basketball. You think of going pro, what do you want? Do you want that league or do you want what that sport or that game you're playing can provide you that you can do for yourself and your family? See, that's why I say when you set your setting goals differently, you will get different results. So just imagine if I 
woke up way back then and said from day one, I wanted to play in the NBA. This is, this is just my understanding of my spiritual life. If I said that, I probably wouldn't have any of my children. Mm. You know, think about that. So I'm yeah. living a type of life where I'm guiding my goals and my purpose. NBA, NBA, do this, do this, do this. And I'm not going to meet this woman. I'm not going to meet this woman and be in this place. So me saying, okay, let me just, okay, family, family. I've always been family, 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 family. The basketball is a means to take care of family. So the basketball in my life, it showed me that, look, for what I think and feel about family, this is it for you. This is going to give you everything because you love it, you enjoy it, you can manifest this, you can create this, run with it. And, and that's, it's the same difference because that's no different than someone saying NBA. It's just a different, just a different, you know, viewpoint, a different thing to focus on. It's just that now that we're in different areas of our lives, the NBA may still be there and I'm not a part of it, but my family will always be there. You know, so that's why I say my focus has never changed. You know, so I may not be playing, but family is still important to me and I still do the things I do for family. You know, so even when it comes to my basketball family, it's all the same, man. These guys that I'm talking about, I wish I could remember everybody's name. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I got a thousand memories. I played around the planet. I had a lot of fun. And not just on the court. When, when, <laughs> when I was going out, I made sure everyone had fun that came with me. <laughs> That's I great, to, man. That's great. I knew how to enjoy life, man. Do, do you think um, the lockout was a blessing for you? The NBA lockout, was that a blessing? I mean, I didn't see it at the time because, I, especially the first one, I'm working hard to try and make the team. I mean, I can't explain what it was like in that gym. What I can tell you is I was going bananas up there in Denver that first year. Mm. With, the, with, the, with the altitude, the air, I'm walking this – when I say walking the streets, like, because I was drafted out there – I don't want to say I can do what I want, but I, I didn't have a stress for anything. I just had to go play basketball. I, I can't put it any simpler than that. I was there. I was training. I was working out. And I forgot who it was, but they will tell you. It was known that they were telling me I was jumping too high. They were saying, Anthony, you don't have to jump so high. Stop jumping Woo! so high. And what I mean, I mean, for an entire three-hour practice, I was jumping over everyone. Wow. Everyone, everyone. I mean, from the beginning of the drills to the last one-on-one -on -one individual workouts to everything. And in the end, we had a lockout. <laughs> but that's the thing. They kept my rights for three years. And part of the story, Greece, Spain, Italy. In those years, I'm still overseas training, still coming back, doing certain things. It was just... It was a lot, man. Like I said, for me, it was all a learned experience. It was, I'm not looking at it like that, even though I am learning and I was learning, but I was definitely taking it all in. I, mean, I enjoyed it all. You know, when I say enjoyed, I found a way to make myself happy, even when things were going bad. Mm. So this thing was happening here with this team. I'm going to go watch the sunset. You know, I'm going to go a place where I could be at peace, if not here in this country or on this island. Because remember, I took advantage of where I was. I'm in Greece. Greece. Come on now. I'm not going to sit wherever I am and be upset. I'm going to go visit somewhere. I'm going to go drive somewhere. I'm going to see some monuments. I'm going to get my mind off with them and take a thousand snapshots. I'm in Madrid. I'm in Barcelona. These are places I used to read about. I'm taking the time to take a take my own personal visit and trip to Egypt. These are things I used to read about in school and say, you know what? I want to go this. Now, I got some freedom for myself. I've done this for family. I've done this for teams. Where do I want to go? I went to Egypt. And I didn't want to leave. I mean, I had to, but, but these are the things I say basket, basketball and these people, they made that for me. You know, I, I can't stress that enough. Yes, the people that I met playing street ball helped me to go visit Egypt. <laughs> you know, the, the yelling high school and college coaches, yes, helped me get into all these other places afterwards. Not for what they did and their kind words, but 
everything is a path and a direction, man. It's what you do with it and what you do after that. I mean, yeah, we all going to take it hard as young men, but in, in the end, I didn't take it personal. Yeah, I don't feel like any coach should speak to young men a certain way. I believe all men should be spoken to a certain way. But yeah. for me, I still took it and used it to make something from it. That doesn't mean that some other kid can't still take something positive that some coach is telling them. You know what that's I mean? Right. So that's why I'm saying I'm not that's why I said, I'm not gonna put them down for any coaching style, for what they did or for what they said, because it had a purpose and it got me to my goal. So I'm thankful for that. <laughs> for sure. And, and like Garfield said, man, basketball uh afforded us to do a lot of things, man. I see I see one Garfield's pen. We need to know how Ant got into painting. <laughs> oh, oh, we, oh, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. I wanna see yeah, we got, we got time. We got time. Listen, you, you talking about watching the sunset, right? Ha have you ever sun gazed, Ant? Are you kidding me? That's like, a part of my, that's a, that's a part of my life. Explain to people why it's not dangerous to sun gaze. Because people <sighs> got this myth that if you stare into the Let sun, me. Let, let's let's, let's and, first start with the simple understanding that sun gazing does not mean you take your ass outside and look at the sun at high noon. Right, right, right. That's, not, that's, <laughs> that's, that's not, the first thing you right, must understand. Right, not at high noon. The, that's when the sun is at its peak, yeah? The second thing for people to understand about sun gazing, the best time to look at the sun is when it's on the earth plane. So right when it's setting and right when it's rising. The sun gives off certain rays. Us melanated beings, we absorb certain rays through our skin naturally, and we take them in more through our eyes, especially in the morning and in the evening. <laughs> sun gazing. <laughs> hey, yo, you, you explained that so well, my brother. And, and the fact that you said on the earth plane, because you reason, I say I say that because you know because the sun moves up and down throughout the day. But like I said, and I I say this specifically because when I say I watch sunrises and sunsets around the planet, so I appreciate a good sunrise and sunset. Different colors, dusty from the desert, the colors from the different ocean, different sky skies, uh, just whatever. But. As you're doing this, this is before I was really knowing sun gazing. You feel it. I yes. can't tell you. I'm not going to lie. Sun gazing helped me on the basketball court. I was doing this for years before I knew it was a thing just because I like sunset. But this way, I was sun gazing on my balcony in the Bronx on 220th and Carpenter before I knew sun gazing was a thing. That's I said, the way, the, way, the way my building was in the, at the end of the block on Carpenter with the sun rises and sunsets, I could see it all because we had a tall building, but at the bottom of the hill, you have, what's that, uh, Bronx River Park. Yes. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing but sky down there. <laughs> so literally, no, just go no, out. Our God Corbett said, preach past the pill. <laughs> <laughs> our God Corbett, what up, Corbett? Yeah, man. I, guess I, I got a bunch of memories, man. Like I said yo, two brother, memories. I, yo, let me tell you. Just, just being on that high science and... Eric, I want to say shout out on. to Eric Jones, too. I'm just looking on the list real quick. Yeah, yeah. Sun gazing people, especially our millionaire people, please get into that. Right early you know, in the morning and, 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 and that dawn. And, 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 and I have to say this too with the sun gazing. I mean, we always talk, and depending on where we're from on the, the planet, you know, yeah. when I say our, our background, I don't care if it's southern, west coast, island. If, if we go back, and this is just me understanding my family from Antigua. This is just me understanding my mother and her stories that she told me from being down in Georgia on a plantation picking pecans. Mm. The sun does something to you. If you listen to your, that's, that's what I say. I was always a good listener. I may not have always paid attention to people. I may have always done what you said, but I was always listening. <laughs> so when you hear these stories about your family and melanin and blood and sun, that for me, that used to always resonate. So, I mean, we all know how we, us black people love the sun and we call these cliches, but this is scientific fact. This yeah. is proven. Like I said, I hear it enough. I mean, let me see if this, is, this, this stuff is true. You look it up and it's true. 
So then you find out, okay, I've been doing this for years, so all I got to do is change how I think about it, and I can actually take in more energy from the sun, not by looking at it longer, but just by understanding it better. So just by me saying, okay, I'm sun gazing, I'm going to watch the sunrise this morning is one thing. But for me to say, okay, I'm a sun gaze today, I'm watching the sun for the same amount of time, I'm taking in this amount of energy, I'm going to focus this type of way, I'm going to feel it and feel it fill and go my spine, my chi, my brain, my crown, and do all of these other things. That's how you activate the energy. That's why I say I've learned all of this through basketball. Like I said, without those sunsets, I would have never known this. I, I, like I said, the one key, one, two key sunsets and sunrises that were time periods that opened up my eyes. In Lebanon and Egypt, it's, it's a different thing when you in Egypt, and this was like more towards the end of my career. I'm still kind of playing ball, but it wasn't that serious. I just had an opportunity to live there and or play there. But I'm staying in a place where I got a view of the pyramids. And when I, I say that because I say the pyramids not – I say it because it's the, the pyramids. Like, I, I used to read this in a book. You see them on cartoons as a kid, you know. So for me to be sitting there, I, I can't even, there's no words for that. But then when you start seeing these sunrises and sunsets and the energy and those, those kind of things change you, man. Like I said, it, it puts things into perspective, you know what I mean? So then it's like, you know, this basketball thing in my life and everything else, there's more to it. You know, that's what at least that's what it was for me. Like I, said, I enjoyed, I enjoyed no, all the ball I had. I enjoyed all the traveling. I have no complaints about my career, other than maybe a few people. But even those people aren't people I played with. Just agents and lawyers and business people and accountants. I try to do a lot of business, man. Like I said, people don't know. <laughs> what, what What was your favorite country to play in, and why? Ah, every I think a lot of these places had their I can't even say minuses, but had their benefits. So I love Spain. Spain had awesome competition and awesome food. <laughs> you know, and when I say food, imagine and now when I say Spain, now you gotta remember, Spain Spanish is different Spanish than the Spanish we know here. Yes. So imagine all your Venezuela, Ecuador, Puerto Rico. Imagine all that rolled up into a country. <laughs> and imagine all of those flavors from all of those places that we talk about here in the South American countries and everything else. Imagine all that in a country that tastes different, that's united. And like when I say united, those places are broken up. Like Spain, those are like little pieces of Spain. You know what I mean? But So when you're out there and you're experiencing it as a whole, it's different, you know. That's a lot to the, the, the process. <laughs> uh, Italy, Italy. Oh, I don't have enough words for Italy. There's a lot. There's a lot of peace and love out there. When I mean love, people people talk about the French and love. Italian people are all about love. <laughs> I mean that like within, within themselves. The love for their food, the love for their family, the love for cooking. You know, it's really all about love for them. <laughs> uh, let's see another place. That's why every place has something different. Greece was, for me, just beautiful. Certain parts of Greece were more beautiful than others. The countryside, the beach side. But that's more of a, a peaceful thing for you to relax and enjoy your life. So you have Athens and you have the big city. And I've been in these places on New Year's. But then you can still walk out of all of that and not see any of it. Like, I've been out literally in the countryside and driving along cliffs, something called Poseidon's Peak. And, like, there's a bunch of stuff out there, man. Like, wow. if you, if you, that's why I say people, that's why I mentioned earlier about playing in the NBA and playing basketball to earn money to take care of your life and family. Two different things. The NBA will give you for sure what it does and overseas will it too. You can take the money from the NBA and travel and enjoy your life and see all these things. But no matter which side you choose, it's at a cost. I'd rather be in the country, experiencing the country, experiencing the people, the food, walking down the street, living there, than visiting there. That's all I'm saying for me. So, yeah, even though I could have played in the NBA and visited countries, 
for me, it was meant for me through my experience to be in these countries to live and play. You know, that's why I say people have to figure out what they want. You know, the NBA is there for you if that's where you're going. And you have people that will train you and guide you all over the planet for that. And it's the same thing for overseas. It's about the player and what experience do you want to have. You want to take care of your family, fine. Which road do you want to take? Like you were saying, you have all these other minor leagues and you have the NBA, but then you have an entire planet that's playing basketball as well. How do you want to go about doing it? And that's what kids need to think about. They're not seeing that there's a thousand leagues in these countries. They don't know that Spain, I don't know how it is now, but at the time had two divisions, the A and the B division. They don't know that different countries have different divisions, but each division, depending on the country, you can still get paid six figures. Like, they don't know this. Well, you know, these we are... have one kid. He's probably going to be your size. His name is K-Money, 730. What's up, K? He's from K-Money, what's up? He's always in the check-in. I think he's now like six, eight, six, nine. He's probably like 13, 14 years old. Woo! He's like one of the best players down in Florida, so I know he's going to have a good future. Hope you listen to these lessons, K. Very good lessons for my guy. And, 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 and that's the thing, too. And that's kind of the, the one thing I'm hoping for in the future. Like I said, that's why I don't do a lot of interviews, because I just sit back and watch. I'm, I'm old school. What do you say? You let your shit bubble quietly, and then you blow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm literally sitting back and I'm watching everything. So I, I'm waiting for a time because I I see these young men out here and I see the young women out there and I see them going hard here in America for this American dream. I just hope that a lot of them see that the dream is about getting and achieving for yourself and your family, not the American dream. You know, what do you need for your family, the your American children, dream can your future? A that's my point. And that's kind of what I'm saying. I don't want to advocate anything negative at all. I'm just trying to talk to people about perspective. Right now, these young men that are focused on the NBA, focused on your life and your career. Because the thing is, if you focus on the basketball, the basketball itself is broader than the NBA. The NBA is a league. The basketball is worldwide. That's what they need to understand. And it can take you around the globe. And that, that's the thing. That's why, that's why I say I, I can't complain. I can't complain because just me saying to myself, I'm going to get out the house and go shoot around because there's some drama in the house. You know what? I got a little bit of energy today and it's three. I can't, you know what? There's a time I used to go and shoot at two, three, four in the morning just because the parks are empty. It's quiet. I shoot in the dark. But these are the things you do to say, okay, this is what's going to help me. This is what clears my head and mind, but these are the things that also help you in these other countries, in these other places. I can't tell you how many times I knew that shooting out in these parks in the Bronx in the dark made it better for me in some of these horrible gym, gyms overseas. <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> and, and some guys get turned off by it and don't follow their dream. They come back home because it's not what they're used to. Yes, I've, I've definitely witnessed that. But that's that's why I say, and I'm going to say it now, people are spoiled <laughs> here. <Yeah. clears throat> We're used to things being handed to us. Now, overseas, and this may be just my experience, when you're that one or number two guy on that team, they're going to take care of you. You know, but I had to work for that. That wasn't just handed to me. You know, a lot of these other guys that may have been on other teams or, or maybe a, a, one of the uh, other divisions, the B League or whatever, they were still getting paid, but it's still a certain amount of output that you have to – it's like input-output, man. Like I said, it's, that's why I say I was lucky. Like, I'm not – it's not, it wasn't even about talent all the time because I may have had talent and skill, but – I still think that my talent and skill got to where it was because of the people I met. Mm. If I didn't meet those people, I wouldn't have been as good. I still had fire. I still had drive and I still had passion, but those people helped mold that into something. You know what I mean? That, that's why I say it's hard to explain that. Because when you have these guys that say, well, I can't, I can't maintain well, who was guiding you in the past? <laughs> you know, I was molded by young men that were men when they were young. I was molded by young men that were battling, and I was molded by, you know, a, a different being. 
you know, so when I go overseas, I can take it. We're, like you said, we're cut from a different cloth. It wasn't about a, a type of attitude or arrogance attitude or ego attitude. It's about a level of knowledge, knowing that I was in the trenches in Harlem, New York, Bronx, Brooklyn, and Queens. Even though I'm overseas in this foreign country, as a man, I could carry myself as a man in the world, and I could carry myself on the court because of my training. I have nothing to fear, and I have nothing to worry about. And you was taken care of because you was producing. Uh, my guy, you know, he said, they're going to take care of you, you know what I'm saying, until you stop producing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you know, sometimes I, I, even, I even fell into a situation where they stopped taking care of you even because you was producing. So imagine, uh, I ran into this. What? Imagine the team. Imagine the team wanting to cut you because you making too much money on the team. <laughs> they they wouldn't trade you. They'll just cut you because you making too much money. Let me let me kind of elaborate on that. So I'm one of this is one of the, one of the few B League teams I was playing on, but I was still making six figures. Somehow in that, the coach and the team they did some stuff and they messed up with the sponsors. So their money got cut. So because their money got cut, they want to cut my money. I said, no. I said, I have nothing to do with, with what the coach did to mess up the sponsorship. I said, I'm getting mine. I'm, I'm doing my job. So my, num my numbers should stay the same. If my numbers are the same on the court, then my numbers in the bank should stay the same. <laughs> it's that simple. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> You know, but one thing led to another, and let's just say changes had to be made. But I had to take a little pay cut, but I stayed on the team. But it let me know, like it's like you said, contracts don't mean nothing over there, man. Man, I, I've had all types of contracts. I mean, there was one point, I mean, I had a I had a I had a decent contract. Let's let's just say right below six figures. But the bonuses I had, I had now mind you, I was already average in a double double. If I would have just upped my numbers by like three points, so an example, if I would have averaged like 18 rebounds instead of 15, or if I would have averaged like 25 points instead of 20, and if I would have done it for did not like this was this was funny because I had my regular rate, I had bonuses for the year, I had bonuses for cups. So in Greece. You have the different parts, your different cups. So the A League, so let's say you got 14 teams. Those first six teams play for this cup. So this cup is playing these other countries that play in this cup. But you're still in the Greek League. The next six or seven teams play in another cup, maybe different countries and different teams. But the thing is, you, this second team could win this second league cup and still win the first division in Greece. You see what I'm saying? That's kind of where I was. I was playing for Ike, this team that was kind of that next level below, but we were still competing up high in Greece, even though we were competing the second cup around Europe. So there's like the first cup in Europe and the second cup in Europe, and then there's the cup in your country. See, that's that's why I say there's a lot of money to be made if you work wow. it right. That's crazy. <laughs> and, and that's what I was... only get you one time in the NBA, one championship, and that's it. And not only that, but it's, it's one contract, but we figure with that one year, I can get I can get bonuses from just from the year itself, just from playing in Greece. I and now mind you, let's just say points, rebounds, blocks. I can get in Greece bonuses for points, rebounds, and blocks. I can get bonuses for points, rebounds, and blocks for playing in this one cup. And then another bonus for points, rebounds, and blocks in the other cup if it's average for the year. So that's one contract that's set at six figures, and then I have three other ad addendums to my contract that can guarantee me another close to six figures just by averaging more points, rebounds, and blocks. That's more what money, I was doing. More money, more money, more money, more money, more money. So and this is why I say to kids, yes, you can, you can go to the NBA, and they can give you this flat price, but another thing, I like my freedom. I'm not going to keep signing contracts and you tell me I can't live my life. You can't go here. You can't do this. 
You can't get on a motorcycle. You can't jet ski. You can't go paraglide and parasail. No, it's my fucking life. You out, I'm out here blood sweating and tearing for you. I'm going to get on a, a parasail and I'm going to look at the ocean from a parachute and you're not going to find me for it. You know, if I want to say, or if you want to go, if you want to go deep, I want to take my time and my money and I want to go invest and not some big organization, but there's a couple of black people here that's doing the positive thing. They're not NBA affiliated, but you know, I'm not putting my name all over it, but it's something I want to support. The NBA shuts that down too. So this is why I say certain things. Tell, tell, tell the people about that, man, because they, 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 they don't understand a lot of, a lot of people point fingers at the NBA guys and say, you know, you guys don't invest. You guys don't get back to the community. Tell them why a lot of them don't. The NBA got a lot of these dudes by the nuts, and they, and they don't want to say it. You know, they put a lot of rules, regulations, stipulations, and contracts. They have agents talking to you in your ear. They have somebody from the team that's going to call. But, man, you can be somewhere totally random, out enjoying yourself, a little bit too much, and you can get a call from anybody. And when I mean anybody, anybody from anywhere that doesn't know that you're supposed to be there. So you could get a call from somebody in some random office saying, yeah, this is, yeah, Anthony, you know, we just heard you might want to head back, you know, or such and such. Or even the next day, you know, yes, yeah, so we just got a picture of you, such and such. Like, this is, there are different levels to it. Like I said, it depends. There are people that, you have NBA security, and you have personal security, but things still happen, you know. <laughs> listen, 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 brother. Call me on Anthony was on main down with the game and he told Gillian Wallow, which is another podcast, he said, uh, yo, David Stern knew things about me that no one can know. Like no one knew. He knew who was in my crew, who he knew what they were doing, and he called me and told me, We gotta make an example of you because of the lifestyle you were living. And this is why we saw a lot of negative press on Carmelo Anthony for about 10 years. And that's why I can say, man, because it, it happens. Because in a way, that's, and I never want to make it about me, but one thing that was consistent about people that really saw and some people did see, me coming back and trying out for these NBA teams was never about me making the NBA. They were making kind of an example about me. So one people, one thing people never know is I came back and played every year against every top big man for the next seven years. Once I, once I got, once I left, everybody. I can't remember all the names. I know me and Theo Ratliff was in Orlando together. Um, when I, when I mean Orlando, I mean with Shaq. Like we didn't even have a workout. We just played ball with the Orlando team, and Shaq and came and played with us. You know, up there in Denver, up in Utah. There was, there was so many places, man, and so many things that this was, I can't get it all in one show. We have to have more shows. <laughs> listen, listen, you always want me to come back, man. We can do a part two. Trust me. It's a lot of people I got to do part twos with anyway, so it makes sense. You can always come back, man. Trust me. Hold on to it. When you're ready to release it, be like, yo, Pooh, I'm coming on. Let's do it. I got some more things to say. Matter of fact, when if you 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 pick the topic, because right now we covering a little bit of everything, you know, and, and I said, I'm big on wanting to say something more to, to the young men and women out there. So if you want to put together a show and we want to talk to them about the ups and downs, agents, money, just just whatever, I'm definitely down for that. We no can doubt. Do that. And maybe I'll bring somebody else in and we can we can make it a nice group thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, so you guys share, you know, all the pressure mm -hmm. by yourself giving this information because there's a lot well, of information well, to give out there. Well, because the thing is, I'm, I'm funny because this may be a lot, but it's simple because the goal is if, if everybody remembers that everything changes and everything grows, you just got to set in your mind, do what you're doing now. And like they would say in a cliche, have a backup plan. That yeah. is not, I don't consider that a backup plan. That's your first plan because that's what you started with. Me doing my art now, art came before basketball. Basketball right, came. We're going to get to there. We're going to get to there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because, look, whether you know it or not, that song that's in the beginning of the show that I was playing, uh -huh. that's me. Okay. Like, I was rapping <laughs> before I played ball, but the ball took over. 
Yeah, and that's kind of what I mean. You know what I'm saying? And, and I know exactly what you're talking that's about. Still art within itself. I love music. It is art and is an art form. And if you're creating and listening to music in a type of way, you are artistic. And that yeah. it is what it is. Definitely. So, hey, I want to ask you, man. I had Kim Hampton on the show. She played overseas for 14 years, and she spoke five languages. And she gave examples of all the languages she spoke. I was blown away. There was there was one point that I can I can still understand many excuse me, words in many languages. And I can still say a few, but I'm, I'm one of those, I'm, I'm a visual audio person. So what's, what happens with me, like I can be in a room with a bunch of Italian people and understand right now. Right, so right. for me at one point, I spoke a little Greek, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, and a drop of French. Mm. Yo, Ronnie Godfather said you was doing it uh, doing art when we was playing in Cyprus. Salute, bro. That's kind. Of, that, yo, salute to you, my brother. Yo, that's that's the thing, man. Like I said, there are too there are too many people. Like I have too many good, great, awesome stories. Not just about basketball, but, but about life and living. That's that's the thing that the, the young the young people today have to remember that you're not just playing ball. You're you're creating memories. See, for me, I can honestly say, and I know a bunch of people can say it too. I have a legacy. My legacy is still built with and on everyone that I played with. So Ra, just looking at his name right there, he's a part of that legacy that not only I created, but he helped build it as he was building his own. And this is kind of what I'm saying. These, these kids aren't even thinking like that nowadays. These are just words to them. You know, like I said, even though they were words to us, we were living it and walking it and we were battling. See, some of these kids don't even want to battle. So if you don't want to battle, how are you going to know what comes at the end of the battle and the fruits and the rewards that you reap from that? That's that's the thing. Like you said, the one kid that goes overseas, no one stick it out. Well, when you stick it out, maybe that's the year, the next year when you do whatever you do, because now you got all the videotape you need. You win average 25 points and 20 rebounds. And that one place you didn't want to be gave you everything you needed to put you in the place that you wanted to go. Right. Yo, listen. I have another gentleman on here. What's up, my man? Cam 3 Rod 33 He dropped, this young guy, he dropped a lot of deep science. I'm, I wish he was here when you were talking about the sun gazer because I know he had a big smile on his face. I, I got a bunch of science I keep to myself. <laughs> Yo, bro, trust me, we uh, we here with it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of times you can't explain and tell everybody what's going yeah. on because a lot of people don't get it. But if you follow this guy page, my, my man's name is Cam Three Rod Thirty Three. Go on this page. Send you me the send me the um, the the I follow him and he does a great job and give a lot of good information. Yeah, I see it right now. I can't do it for my pay. I can do it after. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yo, yo, Cam, follow my guy, Ant Pell. Yeah, follow me. Right. Follow me on a. Trust me. Follow me at Ant Pell on this one and Ant Pell underscore art, just to make sure. Because if you follow me on both, I definitely you got my attention. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. So now let, let's talk about the art, man, because I was showing my supervisor today, because you know she always asking, you know, who, who do you have on tonight, and. When I showed her your art, she was blown away. She was like, does he sell these things? <laughs> this is amazing. I, is there a question? I don't know what you you, man. Let's talk about that. I've been drawing my entire life. For me, that was my first escape for everything. Because it was for me to find peace. It was for me to get away. It was for me to, when I wanted to sit and listen to music, it was everything, you know. When I say everything, it was getting a, a cartoon out the newspaper. It was sitting in the window drawing my pop's car. It was sitting in the park when he's, like I said, when we're kid, I'm a kid and he's out there playing soccer. You know, I got me a little pad and I'm drawing a tree or I'm doing the bench. But then also, and this is about the evolution of art. It's about when you're in school now and you got little art projects and you got to do a picture. You make a nicer picture than everybody else and you make it a point to say okay i may not know this much or i might not do all of this 
But I'm going to put this pitcher in here and get extra points for the pitcher and up my grade. So then what ended up happening is, and this is just ironic, I blame my mother. I used to help her with her homework. So as a young man, before I even got to high school and junior high school, I was helping my mother when she was going back to school and college and everything else and helping her not with just, when I mean my mother was in the, all type of nursing. So I'm learning about the body and psychology and psychiatry. And I'm drawing pictures for her, for her school projects. And that's how I got better. Literally, so I'm drawing the heart. I'm, well, I said, I'm not perfect, but it's better than she could do. And she was like, well, Ann, can you draw this for me? So I'm like, yeah, I'll do my best. You know, so, and that's how it got started, man. Wow. Little Come things on, like that. that. For those people, uh, right? If you can check out, go to this page, man. He got some, some great artwork. I'm, I'm, I'm working on a little bit of everything, man. I do 2D, 3D, but that, that's the thing. I'm still learning. Look at I'm that learning right there, you know. Now, is that the cue from Saturn? Now, I don't want to get too deep, but. All right, so what, what that is, I made, I made that 3D shark, and I put it in a 3D fish tank of water. That's literally what it is. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. And then I put, like, some, ref some refraction effect, effect on the water so it doesn't look like a straight glass. So as it turns, it looks like it's actual water. You know what I mean? What about this one right here, fam? Like... There's a program I work with. Big fan of Mr. Hendrix. There, there's a there's a program I work with. Like I said, I'm like, I I I like to be honest. A lot of things you see on my page, I do personally myself by hand. A lot of other pictures you see, like that, like that Jimmy Hendrix. That's a program I work with to alter pictures. Mm. Now, the picture, of course, of Jimmy Hendrix didn't look like that. I control all the parameters. That's all I do. That's why I say, depending on what you know. I know the paintbrush, I know the pencil, I know the pen, I know the digital equipment, and then I know numbers. If you know a program and you just know the numbers of how to control the parameters of the program, I can take a Jimi Hendrix picture and do that. Well, that's, maybe that's you can help me with this, because I, I want to bring this guy to life. You see this basketball head, man? Trust me, I was already looking at it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, 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 I want to bring him to life one day, man. Like, really? You know, I, I have I have a bunch of projects. Matter of fact, the one you see now on, I'm, and I, I was working on it today. There's some lips I'm making because there's a DJ I'm working with out here, uh, DJ Sweet Talk. <laughs> okay. So he got like the lip biting thing. So I gave him a couple of 2D images. I'm trying to finish up the 3D one for him. You know, anything like that, especially for my boys, I can do. My thing is, I'm. I'm honestly backed up. Like, so even though I'm working, I'm still, so to your supervisor, yes, I sell stuff. <laughs> I want to sell up, more. I, I, we, we can promote yeah. your stuff. I want to make sure that people know so they can tap in. You know what I'm saying? Well, I'm, I'm still, I'm actually redoing my Red Bubble store now. I mean, I have these stores, but I literally have, I'm redoing my Red Bubble store. I'm redoing my OpenSea account because I do NFTs too. So I'm I'm changing everything up, man. I I do it all. I yo, I'm gonna send you my number so you can give me the game on the NFTs, right? Put Please. it this way, you know my yeah. schedule because I, I stay busy. You just gotta call me on an off day. That's oh, that's all it that, takes, that's Anthony. Not a problem. I'll do that. <laughs> that's, yeah. Like it's literally even today because like today is my off day. I would put it this way right before you called and we did the show. I didn't sleep since yesterday. I was up all night and morning and and all day again. I didn't go to sleep since yesterday. I took a nap finally at like five o'clock right before the interview because I'm on. I'm working on my stuff, man. Like I invest. I I learned something by playing basketball. This is another thing I want to add to the show or to the future shows. I should say. I learned to invest in myself. I learned to market myself. I learned. That a certain amount amount of energy, effort, time, and money will make certain things happen for you. <laughs> I learned that through basketball and saying, okay, I went through these changes with agents. In order for me to get this next contract, 
this has to be like this. In order for these numbers to move up and for these numbers to change and to literally move from this place into my account, this has to happen and I need to learn this. How do you translate that mindset that got me to the NBA and to the basketball, the mindset that got me that type of money, how do you translate that to any other field of life? And that's all I've been doing, literally. Yeah, that's real, brother. That's real. And that's some good knowledge to pass on, man. So before we got out, get out of here, man, um, if you had to do it all over again, what would be some of the things you would change? Or nothing at all? I think the only thing <laughs> I would honestly change that has probably nothing to do with the actual sport itself. I lost a lot of pictures throughout the years. Cause like I said, I, I went through some stuff. But I took pictures of everywhere. I have pictures of the towers before they fell from the very top and the very bottom. I have pictures of things that don't exist anymore. If there's one thing I regret is not having those pictures anymore. I have pictures from around the planet. And I'm, I mean from cities to people, to the desert, to mountains, to jungles, to beaches, snowstorms. I had it all. You know, monument. Let's say monuments. I mean, like old stuff that we that you see in your social studies book. I'm standing in front of it, taking a picture. You know what I mean? Mm. I like I made it a point that I walked nine nine steps up the pyramid. Like I was on the pyramid. I took a picture from on the pyramid, from like down and up, to prove that I was on the pyramid. I lost all of that. You know, wow. so these these are the things I'm saying, man. I have those memories, so that's the only. Regret I have to not be able to have the pictures to share them with other people. That's it. I said all the, I can't even say good or bad because I'm sitting here happy today with my one son. I have four children in total. I wouldn't change a thing. If one thing changes, like I said, that the butterfly effect. <laughs> you go. That's right. <laughs> you change that one butterfly, people don't get it. <laughs> What we're so, saying, yeah, Matt, I, I, we're now going to get into our top five, top five, top five, top five, top five. Okay. <laughs> all right, brother, all right. So, we come to that moment where, you know, I get a lot of guys saying, man, I, I, I don't want to forget this guy. I don't want to, you know, shortchange anyone. But you only get to pick five. All right? Uh, all right, five what specifically? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to go top five guys from your neighborhood. Oh, whoa, whoa. I have a big neighborhood. Remember now. Yeah, you only get five. So now when, now when you say top five, you mean just top five in the neighborhood? The top five that I played with? The top five that's been there yeah, for we're me? Get to that. We're just talking about the top five guys in your neighborhood. So if I would say my neighborhood was the entirety of the Bronx and Manhattan. There you go. Maybe I'm a little biased, but you said top five. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's the hardest part of the show, man. Not for me. Because okay, all right, all right, all for, right. me, for me, it's a combination of not just what we did on the court, but you're also my friend. You know, you, you, you also you, you. you also taught me. So we we're but we also so for me it's like we battled together and we battled against each other. So that's what's making my top five. Well so, I, I got the top five guys you played against. That's next. <laughs> well that's the thing. When you say that, I'd have to now say, Do you mean New York, NBA, overseas, that's, all of it? You that's, see, the guys you play against, that's everywhere around the world. But wait, so if I go to the neighborhood and I would just say who I grew up with in Bronx and Manhattan, crew-wise, 
I didn't. I have to put Master Raw, but we didn't play a lot together. But when we were in Rosedale and we were on the same team, that's a certain people. Who, people give me chills when I talk about him. But Malloy is the number, the second guy, future. Oh, my guy. Never the show. But see, that's the thing that there are too many people. I can't, I can't give you five guards because that, that yep. I'm fine my best. Easy, but, no, the, but that's the thing. I can name guards all day, but you're saying five. So Bob, that's uh, it. But I get. I think what I'm doing now. I think I'm also going period of time. So then I have to add Seth Marshall, my brother Seth from. Marshall, the show. He was in a hundred show. That's what I mean. So. Like I said, there were so many people. I mean, yeah, now, I'm, I'm still thinking about high school, too, but I have to look at past that because high school was a short period, you know? So if we started together in high school and we were still doing it, oh, 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 my goodness. That, you're about to make me cry. <sighs> Conrad. Conrad McCray. Rest in peace, my God, Conrad, man. I don't, I don't think people ever knew how close him and I were. <laughs> he was like a brother to me. Like he, he had too many conversations with me up in Syracuse, down in Villanova, in New York, in the Gauchos gym. <sighs> I don't cry for nobody. <laughs> but that man was like a brother to me, you know. Like, like that's I, I took that loss seriously. And that, yeah, that year, sure. that 88, 89 year, you know, uh, he was definitely one of the best players in the city, first team all city, and your guy. He was McNasty. He was our friend. We miss him dearly. And yeah, you talk about the biggest smile, man. <laughs> Yo, people don't get it. People don't get it because his smile was genuine. It literally was like his whole face. <laughs> yeah. But that's why I said he's in the memory, so... Master Rob, Malloy, Seth, Conrad, if I got to add one more. Yeah. Oh, oh. I don't know. I have to think about that last one. We have to come back to that. All right. Are we going to come back? I'm not going to let you forget. You got one more. I got, I got to think of I got to keep putting in some burrows and time periods. But that whole Gaucho's Riverside time period was big. So. You, you had, you had. Kenny Anderson, Dave Kane, Dave Edwards, Khalid Reeve. But that's what I'm meaning. That, that's, why, that's why I say it's hard because a lot of those guys have played in tournaments. Robin Phelps, Norman Marbury. It's too many. It's too many. But that's the thing. Even though I was close with all of them, some of them were just closer than others. So even though it didn't seem like it, I was still talking to Conrad way after college, and we were still pro and everything else. You know, like I said, up until right before he passed. You know, like he went through. I mean, not Conrad. I'm mixing people. I spoke to Mash for a while too, but that was way before he started his big business. <laughs> you know, so like, Is like Mash, my, Mash don't make number five. <sighs> Mash and me and Mash's battles were different, but that's why I say I'm I'm including more in that the person you know what i mean so even though we had some big battles and i remember the, the one or two times i might i might have fouled him out like i said because even though he had in my opinion a better understanding of the game than me he had more experience than me and his skill was just different i was a different type of athlete so i was very hard to guard <laughs> And at times, I took advantage of that. So even though I may not have had the moves or the best shots and a lot of these other things, because I was athlete, an athlete, a good athlete, mean I played all these other sports. I was athletic. I was quick. I could jump and everything else. And my, I was just getting stronger and stronger. It just made it hard for people to guard me. You know, I, that's why I keep saying I was lucky. So Mash and I had those type of battles. But the, the battle, when you say that the neighborhood, even though all hollows was in the neighborhood, it wasn't a consistent thing, me and Mash battling, because he wasn't really in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? Right. So I'm just trying to think, man. But what's the next question? I got to keep thinking about that one. 
All right, all right, all right, all right. I'm not gonna let you up the hook, man. All right. Uh, so now we talk about the top five guys you played against. Professionally? Whenever. Well, period. Period. I mean, period. That, that's not fair because it. Because I might have mixed why it's called the top five. I told you it was coming. No, no. The, the reason why I said because if I if I mix NBA players in there, then people I play street ball with are going to be left out and feel a certain yeah. way. Oh, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Yeah. So I'm going to start with this. This is my yeah. number one. My number one out of all of them, other than the people I mentioned, because those first five made the honorable mention for this list because they, they included. But the first person I have to put on this next list is Anthony Mason. Recipe Everyone, a lot of people know that when when I would come back and we used to have those workouts in the city, like it was it was hell down there. <laughs> Meaning, I was coming back every year, getting a little bit better and a little bit stronger, a little bit more numbers. And for me, like I said, I, that's all I cared about. I I just wanted to play and have fun and get better and come home and play and get better and have fun. And and it was just a cycle for me. So when it got to the point where I wasn't going to try out for as many teams around the league, and I was just coming home. So I was, I was either living in New York, I was living in California. And it was really just training time. So I would take a month off and then go train. During that training time, the two best places was in New York when I'm hooking up with the Knicks and the Nets or when I was down in Houston. Oh, my goodness. The, the, the games and the battles me and Anthony Mason had, let's just say other people remember them more than I do because I was just focused on defense. <laughs> Listen, Anthony Mason let me know that I could play in the NBA. That's that's one thing, the blessing that he left with me before he left to serve, man. So salute Anthony Mason. I, I, I can't say that's I can't say enough good words about him because it's like that with me too. Like he knows of me through word of mouth, and then I just walk in the gym and I earn respect from him just by how I'm playing against him. For me, that that's love and that's the game for me. Yeah, you know, just saying that you may not know me, but you're gonna respect me after this game. You know, I'll take that any day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Same here. Oh yeah, but yeah. So. Uh, Anthony Mason, you say anywhere that I actually, oh my goodness. So this one is tricky because there are a lot of players that are similar, but this one person is different. Grant Hill. <laughs> I've known Grant, I've known Grant since high school as well. So that's I said, that's just He's different. I can't explain him. He's, no, we don't, listen. I'm, he I'm should gonna, be in the I'm, Hall of Fame. It's, did I'm, they make the Hall of Fame yet? I don't know, but you, I, I'm going to say this. And this, he is one of the most underrated players on the planet, in my opinion. Yeah. I say that because as much as I like Scottie Pippen, I think Grant is better than Scottie Pippen. This is my opinion. I don't, and I don't judge players like that. I'm still going off of what I see. Grant has some injury issues. But okay, I, he got I know he got inducted. Yes, wow, thank you. Yeah. I I know I know Grant before he had all of those injury issues. See, that's that's the thing that I was focused on. See, and there were too many other play. Oh, you know who else? Oh, oh, see, see, that's why I said when I talk to people, they bring back memories. So two other people, it's hard to not keep off the list, but I have to give them an honorable mention. Jimmy King from the Fab Five. Mm, yes, so, yes, yes. But then my other boy that is definitely on the list, and this is what's funny because we we didn't play against or with each other a lot, but he's on the list. Tim Thomas. <laughs> Tim Thomas, yes. Never you know, when we were up there in Milwaukee together, all I know it was it wasn't even a workout anymore. We were having fun. We made an example out of everyone up there. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, Mace, Tim Thomas. Grant Hill. You got Grant. two more. I, I have to put...
Yeah, I'm gonna put Dan Cross on that list. Dan Cross. Now, when is Dan Cross? If he is he from the city? No, Dan Cross is in Florida. Got you, got you, got you, got you. I have to put Dan on that list. Me and me and Dan had a lot of experience together in that one year, and he makes the list because. Friend experience, work experience, life experience, battle experience. We went through it all in a short period of time. He makes that list. And right now, he's a, a teaching trainer down in Florida. I'm trying to think of one more person, man. Just, but that's the thing, too, because with, you with Dan. With these, you're doing good with these fours, man. We, we, need, <laughs> to get, we need to get you to five. <laughs> I'm trying, man. Because like I said, that's what I said. So many people. I played I, against too many said, people. Man, this, is, this is the toughest part of the show. Everyone says it. I got to throw a big man on the list. Because there are too many big men right now. Too many. Oh, 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 oh. Duh. Um, Moses Malone. Woo! He, I not, I didn't only play against him, but he spoke to me personally. He trained me. He coached me just by being in the gym with him. You know, there was another dude that's not on the list, but he went to Riverside. He was living out there. Uh, oh, my goodness. Because everybody knew him because his face was always on the wall. But he lived out there in Houston. But... With Moses Malone and this whole crew out there, when I was out there, this is right after Spain. When you talk to Daryl Middleton, because that matter of fact, that's the story. I played please, in Spain with Daryl. I'm, I'm going to do that. For you. I, I played in Spain with Daryl, and literally, we turned it out so much. He said, Aunt, come to Houston and work out with me and train and do this. I went back to Cali to my home for like a month, and I went to Houston for the rest of the summer. He took me around everywhere, and we did everything. The gym was called Fundy Arena. Everybody that was in or around Houston that played for the Houston Rockets. Oh, so hold on. I see, I, I got to mention Sam Cassell. I got to mention Vernon Maxwell. Like, these are people I hung out with, too. Like I said, we, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of stories, man, because we're not playing ball. It's not just that. That's what's his different levels of respect, because I get it as a professional when I'm seeing – Jordan in the club and you don't want to be bothered and you dress to the tees and then I also get it when you're Sam Cassell and you walk in there with some flip flops, a, a tank top and some beach shorts and everybody else wearing suits but you Sam Cassell <laughs> you know and we both <laughs> but these are the things I'm talking about But these, because with that scene comes a story you know what I mean and in that story comes the thing that you learn that's what, I, that's what I'm talking about. So it's not just a picture of this man walking in that, okay, this is how they're viewing him in the city based on his accomplishments, his deeds, and everything else. But now he has a different perspective. And with that perspective, he is choosing to talk to me because of my few accomplishments and the respect he has for me. So I'm going to learn from that and take it and run with it again. So that's why I say, even though I may be saying hanging out, I'm still soaking up everything these guys are telling me because I'm not, I'm out to relax. I'm not out to party. It's a big difference. <laughs> it's a very oh big difference. My guy Keith Strauss said he played in that gym in Houston as well. What up, Keith? Who? Who played out there? Keith Strauss, he, New York great, but what's it now? For sure. Like, everybody knows the fundy out there. Everybody. Mm -mm -mm. That's crazy. So, did, did, you, did you get... That, that one more for the neighborhood, or we should move to the next five? Because it's the last five. All right. I got to add one more. I think you said that was supposed to be the neighborhood, but I had to add other people. I couldn't help it. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but if I have to add a, a New Yorker right now. Oh, are you kidding me? Carl Hines. Carlton Hines, rest in peace. And, and like I said, this is why, and that's why I said this is no disrespect. To the, the, the my high school friends and my college friends that are still in New York as well, but there was there there are different people that have a different effect on your life. Dave, yeah. and Mike had, and I, I mentioned them because they were the first two people that really 
gravitated towards me in Stevenson, and I was able to go down to Harlem and, and make the circle. You know what I mean? I stayed in Dave's house. I stayed in Mike's house. They, they, there's a different understanding there. I will never forget them. They were part of my life and my life experience. I, I'm thankful for that. Carlton Hines was a different person that came from a different era, a different time period, was built differently. So, yes. even and though... In the Cell, they went to my prep school uh, up in MCI. And this is kind of what I mean. Remember now, Carlton was into other things. So, yes. seeing him come into Stevenson and play ball a certain way, he didn't look like any of us. He was a man, literally. Grown man, he, yes. He, he was doing things in that gym that made all of us look like children. So Woo! I, I say that wholeheartedly. And I, I say that with the tear mark because I consider him a friend too because he knew, even it's funny because we were around the same age, but he was older and more mature than me. So with that, he, he, he spoke to me a lot. That's why I appreciated him in his time. Because even though we were the same age and he still looked at me as a young boy, I appreciated his maturity because, like I said, it was, it was hard to explain that, you know, because everybody knows he was into a lot of stuff, you know, but he knew I was going through things and he was there to try to help me in terms of understanding, school, whatever. Just, it was a lot coming from a guy he, he that was my back, age. And, and, yo, he had a big heart, man. Salute to my guy, rest in peace, to Carlton Hodge, New York City. For sure. Method. For, For sure. sure. And, and I know this means a lot to my guy, Keith, because him and Carlton was very tight, man, so... Absolutely. It's hard for me to even mention these names and not tear up because these people were actually important to me, man. Like they were like real friends and they we called each other. Like Carton called me at my grandmother's house, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, Conrad, me and Conrad, we hung out together, like in certain places. Like he spoke to me about life. He spoke to my daughter when she was born, when she was a baby. So <laughs> these people are important to me, you know. All right, we're going to wrap this up with our last one. You know what I'm saying? What's the last wow. one? Yo, my guy, my guy Keith Strauss said he's tearing up right now, too, man. Carl meant a lot to all of us, man, for sure. And he was the I second guy from New York City to go to MCI right behind myself. And that's what I said. I don't want to keep out, talking man. about it. You're going to keep making me do this. <laughs> Great God, man. Hell uh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, he said he still go to his graveside and visit him, man. That's how close him and Keith was. Yeah, man. I, that's why I say people don't understand, man, because for us, oh, this is just my opinion. What I see, people love the game. They love the sport. They love the accolades. They love the money. They love the glamour and glitz. They're missing out on the understanding of the camaraderie, yes. the bonding, the growth, the experience. Those are the things that make basketball what it is. So, like I said, it's not just about saying, oh, I'm going to Vegas. We got a trip to Vegas. No, soak it all in. Go out there and play ball, but see the city. That's what we did. That's how we enjoyed it. We went out there, we took walks, and we got in the van, and we took rides. You know what I'm saying? But imagine taking that mindset and growing with that as you get older now. And that's what these kids are missing now because they just want it immediately. I want this out the plastic now. I want it now, now, now. Like, <laughs> nah, you got to work for it. You got to battle for it. You got to bleed for it. You got to sweat for it. And they don't get that. That's real, man. You hit it right in the head, brother. All right, last one. We're going to get you out of here, my brother, so you can go tend to your family. And we're definitely going to do a part two. Okay. All right? Now, I need to know your top five players in New York City history. New York City for me? Yep. And remember, I don't know everybody, and I was still young, but I have a good memory. <laughs> now this is your five. My five may be different. My five my five changes every time. But now I also have to say what a lot of people don't remember that I didn't spend a lot of time in New York. So even though I was born there, I lived in California, 
I lived in Texas, and I lived overseas. I, you only saw me in the summertime. <laughs> so my my list may be a little skewered. That's okay. That's all right. Um, so tell me again the top five. What? I, I want to be clear top on this. Top five in New York City history, right? So I, I got interviewed oh. uh, last Friday of uh, News 12, Sports Desk, right? No, wait, wait, wait. I want to say it before I forget. I got to get like two or three names off the top of my head before I forget. Okay, you got it. You got it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I, I'll give you some time. All right. John Strickland. John Strickland makes some noise. <laughs> New York City lesson. And John Strickland. Ray for Austin. He's on Ooh. that list. I'm a friend of the show. All time. All time. Got to put Malloy back on there. Future. Oh, oh, I'm going to finish it out. President Terminator. Look at that. Look at that. Look, yo, you, you got that, do that with a breeze, fam. And don't get me wrong, half man, half amazing, my boy. I, there's, a, there's a whole list of them. But those yo, two, that, again. I thought I had to buy you some time, fam. That was awesome. <laughs> I, I had to go there. That, 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 that's, that's me and my experience. So that's why I had to. That's my list. <laughs> Damn. So, like I was saying, they asked, he asked me my top five. You know, I gave him Tiny Alter Ball, Pearl Washington. I said Lloyd Daniels, Bernard King. And he you know just what, knew Lloyd? I was going to say Kareem. Hold on. I, 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 I was from Rolando Blackman. He was the first pro guy I interviewed on my show. He's from Brooklyn, second team all city, and became a full time NBA All Star and an Olympic gold medalist. You know so, what? I ha I have to I have to add. You know, and this is definitely my fault because like I said I know too many people. Lloyd Daniels makes every one of those lists for me, and and the reason why I say that because even though I met him towards like in the more towards the beginning of my professional career. So I didn't know Lloyd much throughout high school and college. I knew of him. But once we went pro, once I went pro, he became a friend. You know, and I say that because he has life experience. He has yes. ball experience. So when he spoke to me and then people, I don't know. I don't know what everyone else thinks and feels when they see what they see on TV. You know what they when they read shit. We but, don't pay attention to those things, man. And that, and that's kind of what I mean. When 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 you sit with a person that has that much experience and he's just just talking to you regular, you'd be surprised at what you can learn, man. <laughs> you know, not just about the sport. I, I'll I'll say this: this man had a conversation with me before a game in Italy. I'm just gonna say this, and, I, and I've never seen another human do this, and I. And even just saying it inspires me to want to do anything in my life, anything. I don't even care if it's not even basketball related. This man spoke to me so peacefully about life and achievement and accomplishment. And then went out there and put, the, <clears throat> put out 69 points at halftime. Yo, imagine sitting there with somebody that's talking to you like a Godfather movie. And you're having a conversation about life and basketball. And he's talking to me because I'm complaining because we're playing on these tile floors that got some cheap rubber over it. I'm doing what I can to make sure my knees are okay and the gym is cold. And he goes out there and puts up 69 points at halftime and only finished. This was funny. And e when I say easy, I, I, Michael Jordan couldn't do it. LeBron James couldn't do it. Nobody in the league now, and I, I, don't, I don't say this about any human. I don't talk, I don't even watch basketball anymore. I Me love either. the game. Me I either. love the game. I still play, but I don't watch it. And I will tell you, I've not seen a man alive do the things that Lloyd Daniels can do. Not Magic Johnson, not Larry Bird. I was on the court with Magic Johnson. I played with Magic Johnson in the, in the L.A. Summer League in Long Beach. I've not seen another human do what Lloyd Daniels does. I was with Larry Bird when I was trying out for the Pistons, and, of course, we all watched him on TV. I've not seen another man do what Lloyd Daniels can do. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. <laughs> I don't care how old you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to make sure I, I, I send this to Lloyd. 
so you can check this out. It's going to put a, a huge smile on his face. Ah. He hits me up every morning. Salute to my brother. Great human being, man. And I'm so proud of him right now. You know, I, I have nothing but love for every name I mentioned and all the brothers and all the places I was at, man. Because it was hard for us, you know. The teams and money, sometimes they pit us against each other. You know what I mean? But yeah. you know what? It's all love, man. Seriously. So that's all I have at the end of the day. Yo, brother. Hell of a conversation, man. I'm glad we got a chance to do this. And this is only part one, because we definitely going to do a part two, man. I appreciate you, man. I, I'm all with it. Like I said, catch me on any time I got off. We even got to schedule it, man. Just hit me on a Sunday, say, hey, we're going to talk tomorrow. <laughs> bet, bet. We're going to do that, man. We're going to do that, man. I appreciate you. Definitely going to send us out to Lloyd, man, and definitely call him, let him know you showed him a lot. You know what? Everybody, man. Because my, my, my thing is, too, I want to reconnect with all of them. Because, like I said, I... I disappear on purpose. <laughs> so my thing is, if you if you hit all of them up and they got their accounts and I can relink back with them, do all of that, please. I can now, I'm, I'm going to send you Lloyd stuff. And I'm Everything. Them, yeah, we're we going to reconnect. And look, I, brother, pre I appreciate I, it, man. We, we should do like a, a, a Zoom call one day, have us all on, and this way guys can reconnect. And man, just imagine, just imagine you got like 20, 30 people on that Zoom call. <laughs> Listen, brother. We're going to put it together. Trust me. We're going to put it that together. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, brother. You go ahead, man. Enjoy the rest of your evening and your family. And thank you, brother. I appreciate you. You know what? Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your, your platform, your network, and your time. You know what? You are a part of my journey as well. And I appreciate you. And thank you very much. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Enjoy your evening. You have a good night, man. All right. Take care. All right. See how life works, man? You have no idea what this game can afford you. You have no idea how many places this game can take you. You really have no idea the connections and the camaraderie that's built with all the players that you played against, that you played with, that you came up with, you cried with, shared stories with, and it all comes back full circle. Anthony Pill, we proud of you, brother. You made New York City proud. You made your parents proud. The family that you have now, you're holding them down and doing what you're doing on and off the court. We celebrate you tonight, brother. To all my basketball heads out there, thank you for joining us. And please, if you have it, Go subscribe to that YouTube page, man. Go check out other New York City greats and legends, and Hall of Fame inductees like my guy, Charlie Scott, who did that amazing interview. Tomorrow, we'll be putting up Corey Coleman, New York City great, Cleveland State legend. Check out tomorrow, 8 o'clock on the YouTube page. For that, we're about to sign off. I'm your host, Glenn Pooh Harding, and you've been watching Basketball Heads, the official home for New York City basketball. Peace. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Y'all ready?